My sermon for tonight is actually based on a question that I received a while back. Now, um, the person who asked the question will probably know it was them. I don't, I don't want anybody ever to feel like... Um, sometimes I'll do this and I'll preach sermons because people will ask things. And oftentimes I'll think, well, hey... If one person is thinking this way, if one person isn't sure, whatever, there's probably a lot of people that, that might be having the same types of thoughts. So I'm not preaching this sermon against anyone at all. And, and, and please, you know, I don't want you to feel like you can't say anything around Pastor Burson because, oh, he's going to preach a sermon about it now. Uh, and this isn't some, like, some bad thing anyways. It's, it's, it's a normal question. It's fine. But um, it, it, so if that ever does happen, I'm bringing this up. If that ever happens, if, like, we ever have a conversation or if, if I'm around and then you hear it preached about, it's not because I'm just trying to hammer around. On you for anything or for you know it's it's for that simple purpose that usually when one person is asking about anything there's always more than one person that's going to benefit from from that and and it's really good idea so and, and this topic specifically is, is is also just very important it's very fundamental and ultimately what's going to have to what the title of my sermon is helping others grow spiritually so this is going to be how we're going to deal with people, especially as we go out, we're trying to bring new converts in, right? We're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we want people to grow. And one of the things that I notice that, that will happen sometimes, especially in, in this movement, especially in churches like ours, is because people get very excited about, about the things of God. And amen, that's great. I love the zeal. I love the excitement. Right. And, and it's, you know, when your life changes and when you are engulfed in just all this stuff and it's like, oh, man, there's all these documentaries and I'm listening to all this preaching and I'm reading the Bible and, and, and it's exciting to you. Right. And that's great. But there's a lot of people, especially when they're newcomers, they're not where you are. Right. <laughs> and, and, it, and it may be kind of a, a culture shock for for some people to even to be around that. Now. We're going to get into this. I'm going to explain just biblically how I think we ought to kind of be, be dealing with people. But we want to make sure, and this is the main point I think I really want to get across, that we don't um, go overboard with, with um, what's the right word I'm looking for, with, with just kind of overwhelming a new believer, a new convert with, with just too much, you know, just, just kind of bombarding them with all this stuff, especially if maybe they're not as excited as you. Now, when people get really excited and they're, and they're on fire, amen, that's great because a lot of people eat it up. I know when I, I wasn't first saved, but I was, uh, I first newly was going to Pastor Anderson's church, you know, I got saved when I was 20, 20 years old. But it was like seven years later when I finally got in a good church. So for those seven years, I was just kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just didn't really care that much about anything. But once I actually started going to church, then it was like, oh, man, I wanted to listen to the Bible. I'm listening to the preacher. I'm, I'm doing whatever I can to just, to just get more. Right? It was exciting. And the, the fire was lit. But until the fire got lit for me personally... I don't know how much, how well I would have responded to people just trying to almost feel like if they're trying to, to cram it down your throat, right? So in your zeal, this is a warning I want to you, make sure we're not like cramming things down people's throat or trying to push them too far than, than they ought to be pushed, especially when they're a new convert, when they're newly saved. That's, that's probably the most important thing. And, and what we, the reason why we started in John chapter 3 it says we need, to, we need to remember that when someone is a new convert or a new believer, they're a spiritual babe in Christ. They, they're a new believer. You know, Jesus Christ says in John chapter 3, I use this all the time out, so I want to just explain salvation and just the whole concept here. But in verse number 3, he says, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus saying, with unto them, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. And the moment that we believe from John chapter 1, Verse number 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When we put our faith in Christ, that's the moment when, when you are born again. That's the moment when we become a child of God. You are born into God's family, and that spiritually, you're spiritually born again. That's Nicodemus in there saying a song, he's like, he's thinking physically, right? But Jesus is speaking about spiritually, saying, That which is flesh is flesh. And by the way, when he says, born of water, that's the physical birth. Don't let people turn you around and try to make you say, oh no, you need to be baptized and believe. The, the, the born of, being born of water is not baptism. There is no birth. We, we just perform two baptisms today. Mark was not born of water when I dunked him underwater and he came back up. That was not his birth. Now, Lord willing, uh, our, our sixth child will, will be born. And when that child's born, you know what's going to happen is my wife's water is going to break. And then she's going to bring forth. And that child is going to be born. That's born of water. That's, and that's why Jesus followed up with saying that which is born of flesh is flesh. Where he said, except it may be born of water and of the spirit. That which is born of flesh his flesh, that which is born of spirit, is spirit. So he's referring to the spiritual birth. That's the important birth. We all are born of water. We all are born of flesh. If you're sitting here today, you were born physically into this world. You needed to be born in this world in order to be saved, right? Because then you needed your spirit, your spiritual birth. So the spiritual birth is the one then that you receive when you put your faith in Christ. And that birth is, is very much very similar to a physical birth because you start off as, as a newborn babe in Christ. You, you're, you're a new creature and there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to grow with. Uh, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you go to Isaiah 28. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now, what that's doing, it's likening the word of God to babies, physical babies. Physical babies desire their mother's milk, right? And it's their mother's milk that's going to help them to grow. That's their nourishment. That's their supply. But when they're a baby, they can't handle a T-bone steak. When they're a baby, they can't handle foods and solids. They need that liquid diet. Why? Because they're still growing. Their bodies are still developing. They need to grow. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a baby. We were all babies at one point. But I'll tell you what, at 41 years old, I don't want to keep being a baby, right? You ought not to be a 41-year-old infant or toddler. We need to grow. We want to grow. But babies, they need milk in order to grow. And what the Bible teaches in 1 Peter 2 is just say, hey, you should desire the sincere milk of the Word because getting in the Word, getting in God's Word is going to help those spiritual babies to grow. But being a spiritual baby, you're not going to understand everything. You're not going to be able to comprehend all of the deep things and all the meat of the Word and the things that are really, really hard. So we, as maybe more mature believers, more mature Christians, someone who's gone a little bit further in, in the, the growth, we don't want to approach a baby and try to, try to feed them all the meat Right? On day one. Like, oh, you're just born? Here you go. Here's, here's some of the harder doctrines to understand. Right? Here's, here's some of the stuff that's real difficult. And um, like I said, I understand the zeal. Because I, I'm excited about all this stuff too. But we want to make sure that we're, that we're dealing with the, um, with the new believers appropriately. Now, um, Isaiah 28 also gives us some instruction on this. Isaiah 28, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, 
precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So, at the, in verse number 9, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Who's, who's going to understand the doctrine? Those that are no longer babies. So as a baby, you need to get the milk of the word. And new believers need to be, if, if anything, where we would teach them on uh, is, are the things that are milk. Right? When, you, when you spend time, if you're going to spend time trying to disciple a new convert, someone you want to spend a little bit of time with someone that you lead to Christ, the, 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 your time is going to be best spent helping to get them grounded and cemented in the faith and getting them um, just, just secure with the, the milk things of the word. So things that, that go hand in hand with salvation, you can say, yeah, they're saved already. Yeah, but there's a lot of things that can shake that baby up. I mean, what, you, you can never be unborn, but that doesn't mean we don't want them to have just a really good full knowledge of salvation itself. So what I recommend for, for new believers, getting them more of that milk. So maybe instead of giving a brand new believer, you know, the psychopath reprobates that goes over the reprobate doctrine. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, like, like if you do, I'm not saying you're, it's just the worst thing to do to give people information. Of course not. And, you know, people are still human, especially if you're dealing with an older person, you know, it's not like they're not going to understand it at all. But the, the whole point I'm trying to make is like, let's let's get them secure and solid in their faith, especially when it pertains to things like salvation before we start getting into other doctrines. Because let's be honest, I mean, the reprobate doctrine, you, you definitely don't need to believe that to be saved. Of course, I believe it to be true. It's, it's a very good truth, and it's something that's been kind of forgotten, but it is a little bit di more difficult. It's not that it's a, it's a hard concept, but with the way things are today, it's, it, that definitely is not the first thing that I would be bringing up to a new believer. Right? It's definitely not something I bring up when I'm out soul winning unless it's very specifically related to that person. There have been a few people that maybe they've been abused or something, and, it, and it's something that doesn't sit right with them. They're not understanding eternal life and how a monster can go to heaven. Then I'll bring it up. But, but usually I don't. And there's a lot of other doctrines, right? You, you don't need to bring up, you know, anything about the Jews in Israel, right? I mean, what's the point? And even on a new believer, you know, uh, usually what I do when I go out soul winning and I want to leave someone something, if you run into someone who's already saved, you know, out door to door, I will then, make, you know, if, and if they already have their own church and stuff, there are specific, you know, these videos have specific doctrines where I think like, hey, maybe they can use this. But uh, when I get someone saved, the, the one that I like to leave with them the most, what I think is the best, is the Bible version one. New World Order Bible versions. I, I'll, I'll give them that. And that's the one I like to carry the most of. Because it's very fundamental. It's very milk of the word. I mean, it is the word. It's all about the word. So the sermon I preached this morning, it's all about just, hey, this is the Bible. You need to get, get in this. It's not that difficult to understand. There's so many ways you can approach it. But if you can get someone reading the right Bible after they get saved, that's going to be tremendous for their growth, getting them in that word. Another one would be like something about repentance, right, with salvation, um, you know, turning from your sin, anything that has to do with, you know, once saved, always saved, eternal security, all these things are very good topics or subjects, especially in the day and age we live in, we have access to DVDs and videos and whatever. Those are the types of things that we want to be getting a new convert just grounded and cemented in. Those are the types of milk that we want them to grow thereby, because once they get, like, just established in that, established in the Word of God, 
it's going to be easier for them than to continue to flourish and to grow and then understand a lot more doctrines. These are the things that we want to be focused on. So get people grounded in the faith. And as we saw in Isaiah, you know, it's, it's precept upon precept. Every growth is going to take, you, you learn a little bit here, you learn a bit there, and you keep on building upon that growth. Uh, get people grounded in the faith before getting into every, you know, controversial doctrine or whatever. And also you could find out what their interests are and what their background is. So when someone gets saved, a good, a good way to, to maybe help them to grow and provide some information would be to give them things that, that one, that they are already interested in. Something that they're just, just already like, something that, you know, and maybe it is, is a psychopath rubber bait thing. You know, if that's just something where that's where, where you know, that, that makes sense to them and they're, they're really interested in that subject, okay. Or, or whatever, you know, they're, they're, you're going to have to find out from the individual. But um, also what their background is. So maybe they're coming from a, from a very uh, wicked false religion or, or just something, you know, and you know what the, the religion teaches. You're going to want to give them information that shows the difference between what the Bible says and what their religion teaches. It's kind of driving a little bit more distance between, uh, between that. Turn if you would to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. So dispelling some false doctrines based on their religious background is, is another very good thing to kind of start with new converts. Now again, I'm going to reiterate, I, I'm not trying to throw any wet blankets on anybody for following up with converts and, do, you know, and doing good because it's not the intent of this sermon at all. I appreciate all of the work that's, that's being put forth and invested in people. I think it's great. And it's way better to invest time and, and, you know, than not to, just to not do it at all, no matter what. I'm just trying to help give a little bit of, uh, of, of knowledge here and just to be the most effective that we can to, to nurture the, the, the spiritual babe in Christ and to help them to grow. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Verse number 11, the Bible reads, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and to be at peace among yourselves. Look at verse number 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Verse number 11, we start reading, it says edify one another. You know, we're trying to build each other up. That's one of the things we do when we come to church. And with new believers, they need edification just like anyone else. So we try to build each other up. I mean, new believer, old believer, we all need edification. Right? So it's one of the things that we do when we come together. But the teaching continues on there in verse number 14. He says, warn them that are unruly. You know, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're talking about uh, helping others to grow spiritually. We're starting and focusing mostly on new believers. But everybody in this room, everybody is in said at some point in their spiritual growth. Nobody has arrived. I know I haven't arrived. I'm continuing to grow. I want to grow. I want to learn more. I want to understand more. And hopefully you do too. And I think that's why everyone's here. We want to grow more. We want to understand more. So when dealing with others and helping others to grow spiritually, whatever you can do, sometimes that means a warning. You know, when someone's unruly, it means they don't want to follow the rules. You know, there's rules in the Bible. And when it becomes apparent that someone just doesn't want to, to follow God's rules, they need a warning. And we're going to get into this a little bit more and just, uh, just a little bit later. I'm going to deal more specifically with how we go about giving warnings because we want to we want to do that appropriately as well. We're not out on a, you know, trying to figure out what's everyone into, what, you know, are you unruly? Are you unruly? You know, no, this is, this is when it becomes apparent. There's, usually it becomes apparent when people are unruly. We want to give them a warning. Why? Because we care about them. Just as much as when we go out soul winning, we, we tell the unbeliever, we give them a warning that if they don't put their faith in Christ, they're going to go to hell. 
And it's not because we hate them, it's because we love them, we're trying to get them, hey, this is the truth, this is the facts of the matter, you know, this is a warning, if you, if you choose not to believe it, then this is the result that's going to happen. And, and we're trying to give them a warning. You're not going out saying, ha ha, I'm better than you, I'm going to heaven, you're going to hell, right? That's not what it's all about. That's not why anyone goes out so like, not this church. But, um... And that's not the spirit we have. It's, it's warning them they're unruly. But then it continues on here. Look at verse number 40. It says, comfort the feeble-minded. And let's face it, some people, you know, they're, they're not, mentally, they're, just, they're not that capable. And also, spiritually, you know, not just necessarily physically. Because physically, sometimes people have handicaps. And people are feeble-minded. And they need comfort. But even spiritually, someone might not have, might, they might be feeble-minded kind of spiritually because they just don't know anything. They need comfort and they need help also. Support the weak. This says be patient toward all men. So we need to keep patience, especially when dealing with new converts and new believers. Um, it, it, people need time to grow. We can't expect, you know, a super Christian to come out after like a week of, of being saved, right? And even if you've been saved for a while, maybe you're just new, kind of coming to a, to a fundamental church and, and hearing these truths. And, and maybe, especially with married people, you know, your spouse may need some time to grow. It's, it's just the way it is. And we need to remember to be patient. So, you know, you know spiritually, you may be way farther along than your spouse is. And that's okay. And hopefully, you're, you know, the man is more. But maybe that's not the case. All right, we're in reality. That's not always the case. Sometimes the wife is saved for a lot longer, and then her husband finally gets saved, and it's a great blessing, praise the Lord. But spiritually, he's way far behind. He has a lot of catching up to do. And, and regardless of who it is, it doesn't matter whether it's a husband or wife, you need to remember to have patience. And if they are growing, then praise the Lord. That's good. Right? We don't want people to become stagnant and just not growing at all. Like I said, being a 40-year-old you know, baby. We want to see the growth. But as long as the growth has taken place, then we need to be patient. Right? Well, you, don't, you don't want to be too pushy getting someone to grow because that could have an adverse effect um, on their growth. Right? Everyone needs to grow at their own pace. And you don't need to convince, I have one more note in here too. There's a couple things I write down just to make sure that I get out there. And again, this isn't, this isn't, I haven't seen anyone do this or think this is an issue, but it needs to be said, you know, we don't need to convince every single person that comes into this church of every single doctrine that we believe and then argue with them if they don't, if they disagree, no, you don't understand, you know, like, and just keep trying to hammer it into someone. People are going to come and people have different beliefs. Now, obviously, as a church, we have very core beliefs about salvation, King James Bible, and things like that. But, you know, people are welcome here. You don't have to believe every single thing that's like on the doctrinal statement to come and, and be a part of this church. And we don't need to be harassing people if you know someone just doesn't believe about it, you know, and just, just constantly, you know, bombarding them with, with stuff. Because they just may need a little bit of time to grow. I mean, I've met a lot of good Christians that don't believe, for example, the reprobate doctrine. They, they don't, they think, they think that sodomites can be saved. But you know what, they're soul winners and they, and they love God and they, you know, fine, right? Go ahead, go out soul winning. I'm not going to try to hammer that home and just, be, no, no, you understand. This is, you, know, you really got to read this and understand. You know, it's fine. Just give them some time. Because the truth, it'll, it'll come around, right? And I'm not saying you can't ever talk about anything that's different. It, it's just don't just keep pushing and pushing and pushing a point. If, if, if they're not receiving it, fine. Uh, turn if you go to Romans chapter 14. I think Romans 14 is a really good job, especially with the things that are not as big of a deal, right? Romans 14 really... <laughs> helps us to understand the, the spirit that we ought to have, especially when dealing with people who are not as grown as you are spiritually. When you have truth, when you understand, when, when you're grown, especially in, in particular areas and in doctrines and in knowledge, when we're dealing with people who are weaker, how we ought to handle that and, and what the course of action is. Look at Romans 14, 
we're going to read the entire chapter because this, this speaks specifically to everything I'm trying to get across here. Verse number one, the Bible says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Right? So this is talking about someone who's saved. They're weak. They're weak in the faith. It could be a new convert. It could just be someone who's not, who's not been grounded and founded very long, whatever. Either way, they're weak. And he says, you receive them, but not to doubtful, not, not a bunch of doubting arguments and, you know, disputings over things. That's, that's not how we want to receive them. He says in verse 2, For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. So he's bringing up an example here and he's already explaining who's right and who wrong, who's wrong. Right? The one who believes you can eat all things is right. Because that's what the New Testament teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. We don't have any dietary restrictions. We can eat all things. It's fine. They're right. But then he says another who is weak eateth herbs. So they're just on a vegetarian diet. Okay? They're weak, but that's fine. We're going to keep reading this and see what it says. Look at verse number 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So basically he's saying, you know what? Don't worry about it. You know the truth. You can eat all things. Don't, don't hate on that guy because they're a vegetarian or whatever. Let them be. It's not that big of a deal. It's fine. Let them continue on that way. You know, God's received them. And, you know, and he's also given a warning too. Hey, the person who's, who's weaker and they, you know, they're not eating, don't judge the guy that's eating. Let them be. It's their business. There's a lot of things that's between you and God. Now, there's some things, and we'll get into that too, uh, that are more serious. That kind of need to be brought up and people need to be rebuked over. But there's a lot of other things where this is just between you know you and the Lord, you know what you're eating and things like that. Go ahead, you know that's 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 your business. Look at verse number four. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another; another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. So he's bringing it down to saying, look, You've got the weak Christian and the stronger Christian. You both have the desire to serve God. Right? Both of these people, they're the Lord's. Whatever they're doing, it's because they're trying to serve God. And in these particular... And, I'll, and again, I'm not saying that just anything that anyone ever does, just if they want to serve God, that makes it okay. No, but... This is specifically talking about just observing specific days or eating some meats. Those aren't big deals. It's never been that big of a deal, um, especially in, you know in the New Testament here. Whether or not you know whatever day you, you choose, you know there's some people that want to take Saturday as a Sabbath and not work, right? Or maybe they want to worship God on that day. Okay. Now, in the New Testament, we can, we can work. You know, the, the Sabbath is no longer. That was a, that was a, a picture of Jesus Christ and, and the rest that we have in Christ. But again, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself, just dealing with the Sabbath. But if someone wants to do that, great. Go ahead. Because they're putting aside a day for the Lord. Right? They're regarding the day to the Lord. Fine. I'm not going to despise a person that does that. But don't judge me when I'm not keeping a Sabbath. You know, it, it, it's, I'm still serving God and I'm still working. I'm going to serve the Lord. And, and I'm honoring God, but I'm not observing that because I don't think we need to do that. Right? So these, these are some examples that Romans 14 is giving that we're not going to be... Um, that basically saying you don't need to get in dispute, dis, disputations over this stuff. And when we have new believers or weaker people in faith, we don't need to argue over these types of things. 
it's not that big of a deal. It's better to have the, you know, the unity in working together than to get caught up in every little thing that you could get caught up in in God's Word. And, and maybe you're really zealous, and I understand that, but it's better sometimes just to say, fine, we're going to serve the Lord together anyways. Uh, let's keep reading here uh, to get through Romans chapter 14. Verse number 9, the Bible reads, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Now, this whole chapter has, has the teaching of love your brother and care about them and be concerned about you know helping them out and and some of these things that are smaller it's like you know you don't need to get in arguments over it and you don't want to just cause them to stumble and fall because we're supposed to be edifying each other we're supposed to be building each other we're supposed to be strengthening them that are weak and, you know, if I know that someone here, they've got a problem with meat and they've got, you know, maybe they got a problem with eating pork because they don't understand the Bible that well. They, they're not, they're, they still think that that's, you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to go and get some bacon and just go watch. <laughs> Man, this is some really good bacon. It's like right in front of them. Why? What's the point of that? I'm not going to throw it in their face. Why am I going to cause a stumbling block and just try to upset them and anger them? over something that, that they're holding to be true. Now, the Bible also teaches in this chapter that if they think that something is unclean and they partake in that, then it is unclean to them. That if you're not dealing with things by faith, so the person that thinks, if someone thinks it's a sin to eat bacon and they believe that in their heart, but then you're like just... just trying to get them, you know, get them, oh no, just eat the bacon, you know, whatever, and they eat it? Like, that's a sin unto them. Even though you may be right of saying, well, it's not a sin because, you know, nothing's unclean of itself, like we just read here, it, it's fine for us to eat, but when you, when the person believes in their heart that that's wrong, it is a sin for them to go against their conscience like that because in their heart, they're not acting on faith. Right. They're acting against what they think is right, and that in itself is a sin. So we want to make sure that we're, we're careful with people, it just in, the, in that type of a sense. Now, again, we're going to be getting there in just a minute, but I just want to reiterate, you know, these are the smaller things. These are smaller issues. These aren't big things. This isn't someone committing adultery or living in fornication, you know, things that are much more serious sins. These are more just, just differences on certain doctrines, right? Now, every doctrine's important. I get it. The word, every word of God is important. But the Bible itself is teaching us here that, that this is, these are not what you want to, you know, this isn't the hill you want to die on. Right? You're not going to go and just start, start making it. No, man, no. And, it's, and like people are doing it now with this stupid flat earth thing. I mean, it's crazy. Like, and you know what? If you believe in the flat earth, you're wrong. But I don't care. Okay? I don't. I don't care. I think it's dumb, but I don't care. This, I, I believe that falls into... Th this this type of a thing. I mean, if someone's saved, and spirit of God, you want to serve God, whatever, fine. But, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to get in some big fight over it with you. Because I know what I believe. And, and, and I know the truth on that. And it's not that hard to figure out. But, I, again, I see that as, as one of these types of a things. That it's like, you know, whatever. Now, I do believe there are some people pushing that agenda, and that's not just your average person. There, there are, there are Satan's at work there. They're trying to make Christianity, biblical Christianity, look stupid. 
there is more involved in that. So I'm not just saying that, you know, there, there, there are some people I would say require much more stern rebuke and, and make more of an issue out of it when someone's promoting and kind of leading the cause in that way. But just an average believer, someone is a church member, something like that, especially a new convert or whatever, someone's a little bit weaker in the faith, I'm not going to make an issue out of that. I just say, okay, whatever. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue with you about that. Uh, let's keep reading here in this, in this passage. Uh, verse number, I think we read this right, but let's reread anyways. Verse number 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. So again, he's saying, you know, let's just follow after just being at peace among itself and, and edifying each other. And just, just for something like meat, just for something like food, don't destroy the work of God. Right? You've got someone who's willing to work, someone who's willing to give the gospel, someone who's willing to, to do that, and you're going to just destroy that work of God because you're so focused on this one little side issue. Don't blow it up and make it into something that you don't need to do. Just, just let, them, let them be because, you know what, after a while they'll come around. After a while they'll grow a little bit. When you strengthen them and encourage them, they'll grow. They'll come around. They'll come to the truth. It's fine. Verse number... Um, 21, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby that brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm almost done dealing with... Um, kind of dealing with newer believers or weaker Christians. But the last point I want to make on this is that most of the instruction for new believers is going to come from teaching at church anyways. So it's good to help people and to be a friend and to encourage, you know, especially someone that you lead to Christ. But you don't need to take on yourself the burden of just teaching them everything about the Bible. What's probably going to be more effective is just being their friend, giving them that connection to be, to be someone that they know cares about them, that you can help build them up and edify them and help to get them planted in church. Because really, the discipling classes are taking place here on Sunday, twice a day, and on Wednesday night. This is the discipling class. This is the teaching class. This is when there is a teacher that's, that's providing, you know, the milk and meat of the word. I try hard in my sermons to be able to give enough for everybody to understand. Um, you know, sometimes it's not always as meaty as I'd like it, or sometimes it's not always as milky as I'd like it. You know, sermons vary, but... I try to make it so that everybody who's here, regardless of where you're at spiritually, can benefit, can grow, can receive something to, to keep moving forward by, to, to grow there with. And if there's a new believer, they're going to get some, some of the sermon. They're going to be able to, to get some milk. And they might not get everything that's being taught, but that's fine. And for those of you that are much more spiritually advanced and grown, it doesn't hurt to have a, little, have a glass of milk with your meat anyways. Right? It's sometimes good to, to hear things repeated, but hopefully you'll be able to hear even more and then grow that much more thereby and, and, and get the whole thing. But that's what's being done here in church. So one of the best things you can do with new believers is just, just be a friend of them. You know, help edify them, encourage them, you know, deal with their specific issues. And, and help them to, to get past those. Because oftentimes, what, what, one of the main things that gets people out of churches, especially independent fundamental churches like this one, is they'll start getting 
uh, attacked by people in their personal life. That's probably the number one thing that's going to get someone out of a church is that they're going to start learning some things. They're going to be talking about it a lot more because people usually do. And then their relatives or their friends or you know, somebody's going to start saying, oh, you, you know, and giving them a real hard time and then, you know, trying to tell them, oh, did you see this person on the news or, you know, you know, and just try to offend them or upset and shake up their faith. But if they have people who are already edifying them and supporting them, it's going to make it easier for them to still stay with it and not to be offended when the, when the, you know, like the, the parable of the sower. So, you know, the sun comes up, it's scorching, you know, people who can't handle the heat. Well, if we're edifying one another, especially new believers or whatever, you know, it'll help them to get through that. It'll help them to stay grounded and founded. Ephesians 4 just basically explains why I believe, you know, this is, this is where most of the learning is going to happen anyways is within church. Look at verse number 11, Ephesians 4. The Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse number 12. So why, now we don't have apostles today. But he's talking about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers as, as gifts or people that, that God is giving. And then in verse 12, he explains why. Why are these, these type of people there at all? Verse number 12 says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So he's saying there's people out there trying to deceive. There's a lot of false doctrine out there. But this is why God has given pastors and teachers and evangelists so that the work of the ministry could be done so that we can all come in the unity of faith. We can all understand the Bible and, and, and uh, believe the Bible and have the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the statue or the fullness of Christ and that we won't be children anymore. So the growth is going to come through the pastors and teachers, through the evangelists. You know, that's where the growth is going to happen. That's where we're going to learn the doctrine. It's going to be here. It's going to be in church. That's where, where it's a big, uh, it's an important aspect of that. Obviously, you should be reading the Bible on your own and being taught through the Holy Spirit on your own as well. But there's a good reason why God ordained the structure of the local church, of a New Testament church, because it is important. We don't believe in this house church stuff, or do, oh yeah, I have my church at home when I you know, sit down and read the Bible with my kids. No, that's family Bible reading time. I think everyone should have that. We have that at my home. But you know what it's not? It's not church. And God gave specific people for us to help all of us come to unity of faith. And, uh, and, and again, I think this is one of the best places to get new believers is to get them in church, to get them plugged in, to get them disciples. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because now we're going to deal now with more mature believers, especially those that should be past the milk. Now, a believer who's, who's past the milk will typically be someone that you, you know, they're coming to church, they understand a lot of the doctrines of the Bible, you often hear someone referred to as brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, they've been around for a while, they're, they're, they're viewed on as a brother, as a sister, they're grounded, they're found, they've been around for a while, they know enough of the Bible, they know what the Bible says on a lot of different areas. But... There comes a time where even though someone might know the Bible pretty well, they're a brother in Christ that, that they get into sin themselves. I mean, everybody, it's, anyone's possible, uh, uh, capable of doing that, and it happens. Now, we are here to encourage. We saw we're here to edify one another. We're not here just to point out everyone's sins. I mean, if, if you spend long enough time around anyone, you're going to see that they're not perfect. So this isn't about being perfect. This isn't about being holier than now. This isn't about, you know, just, just trying to 
get a person's sin on display. But sometimes rebukes are necessary. And church discipline is necessary depending on the seriousness of what a person is into. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 gives us a, a great teaching here. And this is what our church practices and will practice. And, and if any of this is going on, you can, you can expect this right now that this is how we're going to deal with things of this nature. So let's start reading in verse number 11. The Bible reads, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother. Again, it puts that language in there to, to specify this isn't someone who just got saved yesterday. Now, they may be a brother because they're a believer, but this isn't, you know, again, it's not like someone has been around, they've heard all the teaching Bible. They need room to grow because they're just an infant. But people who are called a brother, the language being used here is someone who should know better because they've grown enough to understand that the, where the Bible teaches about these things and that it's wrong. So let's call a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? So remember in Romans 14, it was talking about like, no, not judging, another man's servant, and stuff like that. Well, now in 1 Corinthians 5, he's saying, don't you judge them that are within? He's talking about like within the church. He's comparing within the church to just the world and outside. He said, look, if I told you never to, to eat with someone who's a foreign, you know, all these other sins that's just out in the world, he's like, you just have to leave the world then because the world's just full of it. Okay? But he's saying, I'm specifically telling you that within the church, there are certain standards. Within the church, when someone's going to be called a brother, this is the way that you deal with someone who then gets into one of these sins. He's saying, you don't even eat with them. Verse number 13, But them that are without God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You could be saved, you could be a believer, you could be a brother in Christ. But when you know better, when you've been around long enough to understand these things, and you're a fornicator, or you're covetous, Watch out. I mean, these are all serious sins. I know that in today's society, you know, we're, we're being fed with covetousness through the media trying to tell you, you need this and you need that. And, oh, you need to have this and get you in this mindset of wanting and wanting and wanting and wanting to have the newest technology and wanting to have all these houses and cars and things and focused and being greedy and wanting money and wanting things. But don't fall for it because it's actually a very wicked sin. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. We start loving that thing and becoming covetous or becoming covetous over another person's spouse or whatever it is, what you're just coveting stuff. That is a wicked sin. And if someone's fallen into that and, and that becomes, you know, kind of who they are and their brother, you know, I'm going to put away that wicked person. They'll be put away from among us. And if they're put away from the church, you know what that means? You ought not to go out and go having meals with them either. They're put away. And there's a very good reason for that. Don't get one of these bleeding hearts when someone's determined to be a wicked person and put away. Now look, we want that person to repent. It's not because we want to make ourselves feel good and say, oh, we're holier than you. No, that's not the point. The point is sometimes people need to have enough, like that type of a break to realize, wow, this actually is a big deal. Why? Because most people will justify their own sin and justify it over and over again, and they stop seeing how bad it is. But when everybody is just like, no, I don't have anything to do with you because you're involved in that, because you're a fornicator, because you're a drunk. You know, what about, what about the drunkards that want to say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I just have, I just have a little bit. Oh. I have a beer now and then, and, 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 and they say it's a beer now and then, but they're getting drunk like every weekend. And they want to say, you blow it off, it's not that big of a deal. But when they're a brother and someone's like, wow, the brother so-and-so, they're a drunkard. And people stop having anything to do with them. That ought to hit home and get that person to stop and think, whoa, wait a minute, maybe I should do, I mean, maybe I ought to change this. It's part of, you know, you've heard of like hitting rock bottom. 
Right? Sometimes people need to do that, especially with addictions and alcoholism and things like that. People need to just hit bottom before they'll get right. Sometimes they need to hit bottom before they get saved. And, and we don't want to be enablers and just pretending like everything's okay when people are involved in this type of a sin and they know better and we're just going to look the other way and just pretend like none of this is going on. No, that's not the way things are going to be run in church. And this is talking about dealing with a mature believer. And what's going to help that person to grow, and according to the Bible, is we're going to put them away. Again, we, we want them to change. We want them to repent. We want them to get right. So the drunkard, we want them to stop drinking. Get right with God. Stop being a drunk. And you know what? If they do that, come on back, brother. We love you. We miss you. Come on back. We'll edify them. We'll encourage them. They'll come right back into the fold. But until that repentance happens, no. That's the way we deal with things here. And, and all of these sins, fornication, covetousness, idolatry, railing, drunkard, extortion, those are all serious sins. And when that's happening, you know, this isn't the same as he's a vegetarian. Okay? This is a whole nother level. This is how we deal with it. And again, we're, and I'm not going to be adding to this either. I don't just throw in other sins because I think that, you know, this is sufficient. This is what we need. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Helping others to grow spiritually. Now, um, and the mature believers, you know, obviously I, I dealt with, those are when things are going bad. They're really bad. Mature believers, you know, Hit them up with, with whatever you can. Anything that you think is going to help them. Remember I was talking about the, the new believers. You might want to think before you just start unloading everything on the new believer. right? Give them every single documentary ever made and just be like, look, and I've done it before. Okay? I understand. Believe me. Completely. I'm not, and I'm not saying it's always a, like a bad thing. We just want to be, we, we want to be able to help nurture people and, and, and help them to grow in a wise manner, right? In a way that's just going to help them to continue on. But the mature believers, they, they ought to be grown enough to be able to handle, here you go. Here's my whole collection, right? And let's do that. And, and amen. You know, hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll appreciate it and love it and, and uh and cling to, to that which is good. Now, 1 Timothy 5, we see here dealing with people. I believe to, there's, there's two ways that this verse is interpreted, and I think they're both accurate. Um, I think this applies spiritually as well as physically. And I think on the surface it's talking about physically, but it's also, it's also completely applicable and appropriate to apply it spiritually as well. Verse number 1 of 1 Timothy 5 says, Rebuke not an elder but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. So this is talking about like within a church. When someone is elder, it means they're older. And the Bible teaches that we're supposed to respect our elders. The Bible teaches that if someone comes in with a whore head, like a white head, that you're supposed to rise up before them. You're supposed to show respect and reverence unto, unto people who just are older in general. That's something that, that ought to be done. It's, it's completely lost in our culture anymore. It used to be there. There used to be a lot more respect. And it's, this verse isn't saying that someone who's older is beyond rebuke. But it's talking about how to deal with them, how to treat them. Because you can treat them as a father. Like if, if you're a child and, and, and your father does something wrong, as a child it's not your place to give your dad a rebuke. And just, just, I'm rebuking you. You don't know. You entreat them, right? You, you still want to show them where their error is, but you deal with them in, in a much more tactful, much more kind manner and respectful manner as their son, as their child, right? Saying, here, Dad, you know, and, and you entreat them. And we ought to have respect for elders. Doesn't mean they're never wrong. We entreat them as a father. It says, the younger men as brethren. 
Now you talk to him as a brother. It says the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. So what's this teaching us? We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. It's like a family. And we ought to be dealing with one another as a family. And we don't need to... And, and again, I think this also applies spiritually. So that's why, you know, the pastor, you shouldn't just go and rebuke pastors of churches because they're the elder. It's also another word that's given for a pastor is an elder because spiritually speaking, you may be older than the pastor, but the whole point of the pastor is someone who's not a novice, someone who's not brand new to this, someone who's, who's grown and mature spiritually. They spiritually are an elder, so you shouldn't just be going around and just, just mouthing off rebuking an elder. And, and I think this applies both physically and spiritually. And we should be looking at this the same way. We treat each other as family and, um, and, and with respect. Brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, you know, and, and that's the way that we, um, we deal with one another. Now, turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read for you from Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, I'm going to read for you. You're turning Galatians 6. Leviticus 19, 15 says, You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So there's that famous verse 18 that says, thou, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, coming from the Old Testament. It's a teaching that's been taught um, forever. But the verse before that says, Thou shalt in any wise... It says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. So there's definitely times when, when your neighbor or your brother needs a rebuke. right? They need to be told that they're wrong. And not suffer sin upon them. right? You don't want your, your brother to just continue down some sinful path and not being right with God. And they might need a rebuke. But in the same verse, in the same passage, it's talking about, look, you're not hating your brother. You're loving them. That's why you're giving them a rebuke. And that's why you love your neighbor as yourself is the next verse. It's teaching you how to do that. In Galatians 6, we're going to see the same exact, similar concept brought up on how we do that and what type of spirit we have when we give rebukes to brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, we rebuke people when they need it. We need to identify when that is because if it's just the fact that they're, that they're eating you know, a veg vegetarian type diet, they're not sinning. They're not in sin. They're wrong about a doctrine, but they're not just in sin. So by letting them be a vegetarian, you're not just allowing them to continue in sin. It's fine, right? But when someone is just off into sin, they may need a rebuke. But the way that we deal with that is important. We do it in love. We do it tactfully. We treat them as brothers and sisters. You love them as yourself. How would you like to be rebuked by a brother or sister if when you get in wrong, that's how you deal with them? Galatians chapter 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So the Bible teaches us we need to be meek. If we're restoring that person. They're overtaken. They've, they've gotten into some sin. They're overtaken in a fault. They're wrong. They need correction. So we need to, in the spirit of meekness, approach them. And it's out of love, not because we're trying to take them down a notch. Maybe brother so-and-so is, but you know, oh, he's been around for so long, and he's been, oh, Mr. Holy and righteous and all this stuff. And now look at him. Now he's in the sin. And I, I'm going to go rebuke him. I'm going to tell him he's wrong. That is not the right spirit that you have in trying to correct somebody. I mean, think about it. Think about Job, right? Job was really righteous. He was the most righteous man on the earth, according to God. 
But how did his friends deal with him? When he came on hard, and it wasn't even because of his own sin, but his own friends were like, well, you, you know, God doesn't just do this for no reason. You know, he must have some sin, Job, and, and they just rail on him and just trying to tell him that he must be in all this sin, and they're not comforting him at all. Right? And I think that some of them were a little, were kind of glad to see that happen to Job because he was so righteous, because everything's going good for him. Job was a righteous man. He was performing sacrifices and putting things to God for his own children. I mean, he cared about people and he was doing everything he could to be right with God. And you know what? Some people have a bitter, wicked heart when there is a person actually doing and living a, a very godly life. And they just want to see that person be brought down and fail. And that is not the attitude that we ought to have with, within the church, especially with other brothers and sisters. We care about them. We love them. So in the spirit of meekness, we're going to try to restore that person back to where they were before, not just try to, to bring them down further by giving them their rebuke and telling them why you think they're all wrong. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's the last place I'll be turning tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Again, it's, it's just kind of reiterating the, the type of spirit we ought to have that's going to help your brother or sister in Christ, especially a mature believer, to grow, to get right with God, to grow, to get out of sin, and to, and to be able to keep moving forward. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 23. The Bible says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, so striving is like fighting, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So we're supposed to meekly instruct those that oppose themselves. Now this, these are, again, these examples are people who are involved in sin. We meekly try to try to rebuke them or correct them and, and tell them that they're wrong to get to help them to get out of sin. But this isn't talking about the person who's already gotten so bad, like 1 Corinthians 5, that they just need to be put away and separated from. Right? There's 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 differences of sin and, and, and how bad it is. I mean, some people are getting into sin. You don't want to suffer sin upon your neighbor. You're going to tell them about it. You're trying to give them you know, opportunity. Or, I mean, even if it's if someone you find out that someone like got drunk or something, you want to be like, hey, you know, you rebuke them and let them know that it's wrong, and you try to do it meekly and humbly. But you find out they're not taking correction. They're you know they're they're a drunkard. Then it's like, okay, well we're gonna we're gonna put you away then. So, you know, we, as a church, and, and this should be pretty much common sense, but you know what? People, people do this, and they get into bad, improper spirits. You know, we're not, we're not looking and examining everybody's life trying to find out where your sin is. But when things just become evident, you know, uh, sometimes rebuke may be necessary. But you know what? Oftentimes, you know what's necessary is a little bit of grace and patience. Give people some time to, to hear the preaching. Give people time to, to understand and, and, and get right on things. And, you know, you can bring things up and, uh, and do so in a respectful manner. And, and give people that opportunity to grow. And um, so, I, I, you know, I'm excited about all the work that's being done trying to get new converts. Let's do our best to, to help them to grow and help each other to grow. We're here to edify one another and, 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 and be there and support each other. So um, let's do it. And if, someone, if someone's taken in a sin, to help, help that person overcome their fault. But do so with the proper spirit. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that we can receive from your words. God, I pray that you please help us to, to have the right spirit within us and that we would be maintain a humble and meek attitude, dear Lord. And... Um, Care, care about one another and just want to help to see those around us to grow and to increase dear Lord and that um, that we would be selfless in that regard and just do whatever we can to help others to to achieve more success spiritually and that is to help them grow along the way Lord I pray that you please help all of us here to grow in our understanding and our knowledge and just in our spirit dear Lord help us to be used mightily by you and that we could um we could just do a great work in this area. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.